Hey, welcome to Crossroads. Some wild stuff is happening in New York City, as uh, always seems to be the case. But New York City Mayor Eric Adams announced that new security systems are being constructed in the subway stations. And subways are well on track to basically having security like airports. Now, these include what was referenced as electromagnetic weapon detection systems, as he has phrased it. And these next generation surveillance systems they're putting in the subways are allegedly able to detect if a person is carrying a firearm or a knife or other types of weapons, but can allegedly distinguish a gun from something like a smartphone. Now, these systems are being deployed amid rising crime and most importantly, I'd say, amid growing threats of terrorism. Very real ones. Let me show you this. I'm proud to announce that we are taking the next step forward in our ongoing efforts to make our subways even safer and ensure New Yorkers feel safer in the transit system. Today, in accordance with the POST Act, for the use of technology by the NYPD, we'll be publishing the impact and use policy for electro electronic, electromagnetic weapons detection systems here in New York City. This kicks off the 90-day waiting period before this type of technology can be tested and used in our city to help keep New Yorkers safe. Now, look, it's going to take 90 days for them to actually start rolling this out because of some of the regulations in place, which I'll explain. But in the meantime, they're going to be looking at different vendors and different experts to try to help them run it. And one of the main companies they're allegedly looking at is called Evolve, which uses a system of sensors and artificial intelligence, notably, and they've already started using systems like this at stadiums all around the United States, also in schools all around the United States. Let me show you a video from the company that, again, they're looking at right now to deploy these things in the subways. I'm just going to walk through normally, and what you'll have noticed is that nothing happened. The express system it remained green on the backside. There's no change in the display, and that's because I don't have anything that is gonna alert. It's not, I don't have any threatening items, but I do have the everyday items that people carry with them. So like a cell phone, I have a pair of ear pods and keys. Now I have an item that will alert. Again, I'm just gonna walk through without stopping. The tablet shows an image of me walking through the system with a box where the item was located. Now again, those types of systems, they're already being used in a lot of schools and stadiums all around the US. And they're not perfect either, as you might imagine. There have been reports, for example, that they sometimes confuse like certain types of laptops, like Chromebooks, for example, as guns, and other things like umbrellas or strollers or eyeglass cases and so on. Meaning that, of course, if you're going on the subway systems in New York and, of course, you're pushing maybe a baby stroller or you have a backpack that maybe has an umbrella and a Chromebook laptop, you might trigger the alarms and, of course, be held up a little bit. So we'll see how much this actually affects New York. But the CEO has said that the system is able to detect known signatures of guns, bombs, and so-called tactical knives. But back to what's happening in New York. The rollout of these systems will start with a pilot test in 90 days. And the 90-day waiting period is because of the POST Act. That's the Public Oversight of Surveillance Technology Act that was passed back in 2020. And it basically sets down some requirements of public disclosure and such things on any kinds of surveillance technology the city's using. Personally, I would like to know if they are installing new surveillance systems, and so I don't mind that personally. But with this new system, it comes on the heels of New York City deploying 750 National Guard soldiers in early March to start checking bags and provide security for the city's subways. And frankly, the whole thing is a bit strange. The surface reason for all of this, literally soldiers in the subway systems of New York City, uh, literally, you know, electromagnetic weapon detection systems, if you want to ride the subway in New York City. The surface reason they're giving is just, hey, public safety, right? Uh, because, of course, they defunded the police to a large extent. They've taken away police budgets mainly because, again, they're spending so much money taking care of illegal immigrants, they don't have the money to actually pay for a lot of the services they used to do through the government. But I've been told off record by credible sources that the real reason they're deploying actual soldiers to the subway stations 
and they seem to be so concerned about this all of a sudden in New York is because there were increased threats from Hezbollah terror groups tied to Iran. Hezbollah, one of the major terrorist networks around the world, which works with drug cartels, works with governments, they even have political parties in some parts of Latin America, and of course, being so prevalent in Latin America with the wide open borders, has become a very serious threat to the United States, especially as the U.S. is working with Israel and kicking the hornet's nest of Iran, which is, of course, threatening us now with terrorist attacks. Now, the big concern is that the Hezbollah terror network has created cells operating within the United States, and that as tensions with Iran are growing, and they are, which I'll be explaining in a bit, the terror cells are actually becoming a serious threat. They're working as the kind of gun to the head of the Biden administration's negotiations with Iran. And if you're wondering why Biden keeps reopening massive amounts of money for Iran, despite the fact that it's backing Houthi terrorists who were launching attacks on shipping uh, container ships trying to reach Israel or going through the Red Sea, well, maybe this is why. It's something a lot of people have pointed to, that maybe this is the reason why Biden is uh, trying so hard to just placate to Iran while, again, they're making terror threats against us and even working through proxy networks to launch attacks on U.S. military bases around the Middle Eastern regions. And again, it's because they threw the borders wide open. Uh, Hezbollah terror networks have massive influence throughout a lot of parts of Latin America, as does Iran, and these networks are now presenting a real threat to the United States. Now, remember also that in January 2023, there were arrests of people accused of being part of an Iranian assassination and terror plot where that was in New York City. There were allegedly members of an organized crime group like a mafia who were hired by, again, Iranian networks to carry out assassinations in New York City for Iran. And some of the previous cases, because it wasn't just one case, there were many of them, they involved, for example, going after critics of Iran residing in the United States. They involved, for example, going after U.S. officials, trying to assassinate U.S. officials. They even involved alleged orders to carry out terrorist attacks, uh, again, on behalf of Iran. These were uncovered cases. Some of them are currently being prosecuted still. But this should raise alarms that Iran is actually operating networks within the United States. And frankly, this is all becoming pretty serious. Iran, you might remember, just happened recently. Iran just promised that it would retaliate against Israel. And it's, of course, linking that to the United States in their own public statements. I'll be showing you exactly what's happening with this, though, after a quick break. And for those of you on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Rumble, don't go anywhere. Today's episode is available for everyone to watch. We're not going to just jump over to TV. It's going to be everyone today. And today is also the last day of our Easter sale. So if you ever thought about joining us at the Epic Times, today is the day to do it. We have a special offer, $1 for six months, just $1 for six months. And that'll give you access, of course, to all of our documentaries, special features, and of course, the rest of the episodes when I do them every day, uh, five days a week. So make sure, again, jump on that offer today. It ends today. The link to it is in the description below. Experts agree, one of the best ways to protect against financial uncertainty is to diversify your portfolio. Learn how physical gold and silver can secure your retirement funds from today's economic challenges with a gold IRA from American Hartford Gold. You can safeguard your wealth with no penalties or taxes when you transfer your current qualifying retirement accounts. Call now and our precious metals specialists will send you a free information kit, no cost or obligation. American Hartford Gold, a trusted industry leader with an A-plus from the Better Business Bureau, has a five-star rating from thousands of happy clients. Whether you are getting physical precious metals in a gold IRA or delivered to your doorstep, we offer only the highest quality gold and silver. For your peace of mind, we also offer a no-fee buyback commitment, a low-price guarantee, along with free shipping and free insurance. So don't wait. Call the number on your screen today and secure your financial future. Now, with threats from Iran, frankly, it's becoming pretty serious. 
Iran just promised that it would retaliate against Israel and also labeled the United States as being a proxy force in all of this, meaning its threats are also against the United States right now. This was just recently after the Israeli Air Force allegedly destroyed a building that they say was adjacent to the Iranian embassy in the capital of Syria. Again, Israel claims it was the building adjacent to it. They claimed they weren't involved, but they're trying to clarify this. Iran claims it was the actual bombing of the embassy, so believe whichever side you want. The strike allegedly killed seven Iranian officials, including a senior commander in, the, in Iran's Revolutionary Guards Corps. And Israel claims they, that the commander managed to uh, manage the entire Iranian operation of smuggling weapons from Syria to Lebanon. Because again, uh, the Iranian Guards Corps, they basically run this whole system of feeding terrorist networks throughout a lot of the world. Uh, they're one of the main forces behind terrorism. And of course, is, is, frankly, a lot of people think it's Israel. They're not saying it publicly, but they're the ones getting blamed for it. Uh, as Israel's getting pinpointed for this, these networks are turning their sights on Israel and by proxy of that against the United States. Yeah, well, with Iran, again, we'll kind of see what happens. Any actual retaliation from Iran on this will get very complicated, frankly, very fast. Iran is also blaming the U.S. again for these attacks. Let me show you what Iran's Tehran Times has to say about this. This is one of their official media. It says that the Iranian par parliamentary speaker, uh, he strongly condemns the deadly Israeli airstrikes. This is their propaganda. On Iran's consulate in the Syrian capital, Damascus, warning that the occupying entity will receive severe punishment for the terrorist attack. Uh, they're referring, of course, to Israel as being an occupying entity, saying that it will suffer punishment for this. Further in, it says that Iran's foreign minister is saying that the Israeli regime's biggest supporter, the United States, should be held to account following the deadly attack by Tel Aviv against the Iranian consulate in the Syrian capital, Damascus, and said, quote, during the summons, because one of their main envoys went to, again, speak about this, they say the dimensions of the Israeli regime's a terrorist attack and crime were explained and the American administration's responsibility underlined. And that was a post from the, one of Iran's top diplomats. Now, another individual representing Tehran in the Iranian pub, uh, parliament has asserted, it says, that Iran is fully aware of the violation of international laws and conventions perpetuated by the occupation regime. They're referring to Israel. And this individual, it says, condemned Israel's aggression, affirming that Iran will respond decisively, choosing the time and manner of retaliation. Now, look, again, we'll see if Iran actually does anything. We'll see if they actually retaliate. Personally, I'd say there's a good possibility they will, given how brazen Iran has become basically overall. And they've been like this for a while now. You might remember when Barack Hussein Obama was president and when Obama was sending literally pallets of cash to Iran, you might remember that, Iran was making a mockery of the United States publicly. The Iranian regime even captured several U.S. sailors and then posted videos of them online humiliating them. And since Biden has followed the footsteps of Barack Hussein Obama and given $6 billion in money to Iran, again, uh, relieving sanctions, they say, right? And remember, money is fungible, meaning that if you give somebody $6 billion for one thing, they can take the money they would have used for it and put it into something else. What happened immediately, within just a couple months after Iran got the money? What happened right after that? Well, global terrorism started up again. You might remember that was given to Iran in September last year. And what happened one month after that? Iran launched again by proxy through, again, Palestinian forces, uh, attacks on Israel, and then started backing Houthi terrorists, and then started backing other terrorist networks, restarting global terrorism. That happened right after Biden followed in the footsteps of Barack Hussein Obama and freed up $6 billion to Iran. Now, of course, look, analysis on the extent of what Iran can actually do to us uh, depends, changes really on who you ask. 
CNN says that Iran's options may be limited. They say that Iran may now be compelled to respond despite its unwillingness to enter the war with Israel and the United States. In other words, they might not want an open war with the United States and Israel. They probably want to keep it as a proxy war, which is what they're doing right now. Again, we are in a proxy war with Iran through our support of Israel. And of course, as we try to attack different terrorist networks that are launching attacks on U.S. ships. The United States is already, as we speak, retaliating against some of these attacks. When they launch rocket attacks on U.S. military bases or rocket or missile attacks on U.S. ships. Already, we are fighting the proxy forces of Iran. This is already taking place. And, of course, the United States uh, does risk getting pulled into a broader regional war, but very likely Iran will not want to have a direct war. CNN notes that retaliation in the form of a direct Iranian attack on Israel is unlikely, as it would invite a reciprocal attack on Iranian soil and could drag the United States into a regional war, which, in my opinion, is actually true. And I don't think Iran is dumb enough to do that, frankly. Now, it says Iran may attack U.S. interests, though, such as increasing conflicts with its proxy forces targeting U.S. military bases in other regions. They're already doing this, by the way, but they may actually increase those operations. That is very plausible. It could also mobilize proxy attacks on Israel, which it's already kind of doing, or it may stage a similar attack on Israel targeting one of its embassies, because, again, they're accusing Israel of attacking an Iranian embassy. Iran may do the same thing and attack an Israeli or maybe even a U.S. embassy. All of this is possible. I would actually add to this the possibility of maybe terrorist attacks, which again could be framed as lone wolves. Modern warfare is often, I think, shrouded in the guise of plausible deniability. Countries will not take ownership over certain things. Um, even, for example, with the bombing of the building in Damascus, depending on who you believe, whether it was the building adjacent to the embassy or the embassy, uh, Israel is, of course, talking about it. They're not taking credit for it. Plausible deniability is the way of the modern world, folks. Now, look, regardless, this will very likely, no matter how this turns out, fan the flames of global terrorism. And the United States is getting dragged into the propaganda whether we like it or not. And with this in mind, what was Biden's main response after all this happened? Biden's main response has been an attempt to distance the United States from the attack allegedly carried out by Israel. Axios said the U.S. told Iran that it had no involvement or advanced knowledge of an Israeli strike on a diplomatic compound in Syria that killed a senior Iranian general, according to a U.S. official. Killed seven, by the way. Further, when it says that a National Security Council spokesperson told Axios that the U.S. had no involvement in the Israeli, they add, strike, and we, do, we did not know about it ahead of time. They say a senior U.S. official said the U.S. has communicated this directly to Iran, suggesting again that the U.S. response from Biden and his administration is to try to back off the whole thing. And as this happens, well, what else is going on? Folks, I, I, don't, I don't know, maybe hell has frozen over, but Biden is giving money for border security. But the caveat to it is that Biden is not giving money to secure the U.S.-Mexico border, He's giving money to secure the borders of different regions in the Middle East. The Biden administration is sending $320 million to help build border walls in countries in that region. Breitbart said this, slipped into a $1.2 trillion budget signed by Biden last weekend is about $380 million for, quote, enhanced border security projects in Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Oman, and Tunisia. Why are, why are American taxpayers paying for border security in Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Oman, and, tu and Tunisia when our own border is just, fr frankly, just thrown wide open? But they add that about 150 million of that must go to border security just in Jordan. Now, I'd question again, why are we doing that? I should note, historically, even though Jordan, uh, the country just north of Palestine, or Gaza, Jordan has had problems with Palestinian terrorists in the past as well. In fact, during some of the early wars with them, Palestinians were launching terrorist attacks in Jordan. 
The problem a lot of these countries face is that they don't really want Palestinians. Palestinians, again, democratically elected Hamas. They don't have a positive view of them. Uh, the Palestinians are propagandized and regarded as a bit too radical even for the surrounding Muslim countries. Egypt does not want them. Jordan does not want them. The other countries in the area do not want them. But of course, they're dealing with forces within their own borders uh, that oftentimes, again, tend to be a little more radical, frankly. And those forces doing mass protests and so on are also holding a gun, so to speak, to the heads of their leaders. And so their leaders are kind of caught in the middle of this. Uh, it does make sense that Biden may want to build security borders in those regions to prevent them from being, well, maybe getting pulled into the conflict and creating a large regional war. Uh, again, this is one of the other key pieces in understanding wars in international politics. That what officials say publicly does not often represent what they actually mean or what they actually feel. A lot of these countries, in terms of public narrative, almost without a doubt, are going to condemn Israel and condemn, again, any, any kind of attack on Gaza and pretend to support the Palestinians while also keeping the Palestinians at an arm's length and saying, we don't want them in our countries, which is what, frankly, a lot of these countries are doing right now. You're not seeing Egypt accepting a bunch of, like, refugees. Uh, more than likely, what's going to happen is they're going to build border security at their borders, load those people onto buses as the United Nations does, like, security operations there or peacekeeping operations, and then send those people to, like, Western Europe or the United States, frankly. Now, look... The fact that we're helping other countries build their border barriers, barriers, though, while the Biden administration even sues states like Texas for trying to secure America's border is creating some pretty bad optics for him, just being frank. But back to the issue of Gaza and Israel, the Biden administration is also facing the very difficult issue that regardless of how much he tries to distance the U.S. and himself from the conflict, the United States is getting pulled into this regional conflict. In fact, this is now being reported. Basically, his administration is now in talks to help form peacekeeping operations in Gaza. We're getting pulled into this, folks. Although they're trying to keep U.S. troops out of it, at least that's what they're saying publicly. Politico said this. They say Biden administration officials are in preliminary conversations about options for stabilizing post-war Gaza, including a proposal for the Pentagon to help fund either a multinational force or a Palestinian peacekeeping team. It says the options being considered would not involve U.S. troops, they claim right now, on the ground, which means we might be in the surrounding areas. According to two Defense Department officials and two other U.S. officials, all granted anonymity to discuss the closed-door diplomatic and military negotiations. They say that instead, DOD funding, our tax dollars yet again hard at work, would go toward the need of a security force and complement assistance from other countries. Asked for comment, a senior administration official said, quote, we are working with partners on various scenarios for interim governance and security structures in Gaza. Once the crisis recedes, declining to detail specifics, he added, quote, we've had a number of conversations with both the Israelis and our partners about key elements for the day after in Gaza when the time is right. What does this mean? It means that as has been suggested, Gaza and that whole strip there is not going to go back to the way it used to be. Israel is talking about long term occupation of Gaza. They're not just going to let it go back to Hamas or the Palestinian Authority. Uh, they've come to deem that region as being such a threat to its own territories uh, that they're not going to let it just go back into the hands of, of Hamas. Again, Hamas does schools, terror training camps for little kids. It radicalizes people and propagandizes them. And of course, it's one of the central points globally for terrorist movements trying to justify their own narratives. Part of that being, frankly, the fact that a lot of these countries are tribal and these tribal groups would rip each other to shreds if they don't have a common enemy. And so the leaders in a lot of countries in that region like to use the United States and Israel as the common enemy to make it so their tribal nations don't tear each other to shreds, uh, which is, again, something that even Lawrence of Arabia noted before, that these people, they can't really accomplish much until they can stop fighting themselves. But given the situation, what's going to happen? 
Israel is going to very likely do long-term, maybe indefinite occupation of Gaza. The Palestinian Authority, the weird kind of, again, from the, the, uh, from the Arafat-led terror cells back under the Soviets, funny enough, uh, they become kind of the moderate government that they're considering working with to secure Gaza. And the United States and other allies are going to be working as well for peacekeeping, keep peacekeeping operations. In my opinion, what that will end up creating is an image of occupation that fits directly in with the narrative that other countries are using to frame the U.S. and Israel's you know, persecuting people in Gaza. And that narrative is going to be used to fan the flames of global terrorism, especially as Iran is frankly threatening that right now. In other words, we're very likely to see a larger resurgence in global terrorism because these countries not only use that as the example to try to rally their forces, uh, but again, they also use hatred of the U.S. and Israel as the narrative to unite their people and prevent them from ripping, ripping each other apart. But meanwhile, though, there have been strange incidents in Europe, speaking of global conflict in the bigger picture of this. More than 1,600 airplanes had their GPS systems jammed. And there are suspicions that Russian electronic weapons are causing it, but frankly, it's still unclear. Again, plausible deniability in the way of modern war. Daily Mail said this, more than 1,600 planes have been hit by a mysterious interference that many fear Russia is behind. It says planes flying over and around the Baltic Sea and Northern Europe have been suffering technical problems caused by jamming since Sunday with 1,614 planes, mostly civilian, reporting problems since then. They say that while most of them appear to be taking place in Polish airspace, OSINT blogs have reported that planes flying in German, in German, Danish, Swedish, Latvian, and Lithuanian airspace have suffered interference problems. They say, notably, little to no interference appears to be taking place in Belarus, a staunch ally of Russia or in Kaliningrad, the Russian province separated from the mainland by sea and land, suggesting, of course, that this is being targeted in certain regions. And the question is why, frankly. If it were, for example, just systems established in the region, and again, they were just there, you would expect it to be in the entire region, not targeted by specific nation. Now, it says the planes appear to be suffering from GPS jamming, which can confuse pilots and can make them believe they're in a different location than they actually are, uh, something that can, for example, cause them to get lost or cause their planes to crash. Now, of course, we still don't know what's actually causing the jamming. But again, based on, let's say, putting the puzzle pieces together, if we understand that it's not being caused over Russian-friendly areas, again, the suspicion is Russia. Although keep in mind in the ways of modern war that other countries could do that to try to frame them as well, because that's the way it works. But it is raising awareness, notably on a whole other side, of electronic weapons and other forms of unconventional attacks. Now, modern weapons are not just bullets and not just missiles and so on. Modern weapons also now include weapons that, well, weaponize, frankly, the electromagnetic spectrum and the sonic spectrum. Let me explain. There's even some growing suspicion right now that container ships that crashed and destroyed the bridge in Baltimore recently may have been caused by a, maybe an electronic attack, maybe a cyber attack. Uh, personally, I've seen some of the claims going around on this, so I wanted to comment on it. I should be clear, there is still no actual evidence of an electronic attack or a cyber attack that would have caused that ship to crash into the bridge. But I would say, in my opinion, it wouldn't surprise me if that was the case. Frankly, it wouldn't surprise me one bit. I'd put it off as just speculation for now. But when it comes to cyber warfare and electronic warfare, these types of capabilities are completely possible. And frankly, even if that had nothing to do with it, and again, there's no evidence it was, uh, that image and frankly, that being seen as a way to shut down access, for example, to a major city. Uh, remember, if New York, for example, if the major, major bridges ever got hit, it's landlocked, or it's locked, it's an island. Um, it would cause chaos. And there are people watching this and taking notes and understanding how to do things like this in the event of a war. Remember that during, this, during the Cold War, the Soviets had operations like this. 
when you talk about fifth column attacks or sleeper cells. The sleeper cells of the Soviet Union were assigned to do a few things. One was blow up bridges, another one was poison the water supplies, another one was, for example, to um, attack the electric grid. And so even during the Cold War, they understood the sensitive parts of the United States and of countries that if you were to attack them would disable major, major functions of these countries. This is what modern warfare looks like. And on the note of unconventional weapons, by the way, the Pentagon is now finally confirming that alleged Havana syndrome attacks, as they call them, on U.S. personnel in various parts of the world are, in fact, real. Because you might remember the big corporate media was saying the whole thing's a big conspiracy theory for a while. There's no such thing as sonic weapons. It turns out, well, there is. There is such a thing. And in fact, Newsmax is now saying this. A senior Defense Department official who attended last year's NATO summit in Lithuania had symptoms similar to those reported by U.S. officials who have experienced Havana syndrome. And it says the Pentagon confirmed this on Monday. Havana syndrome, they say, is still under investigation, but includes a string of health problems dating back to 2016 when officials working at the U.S. Embassy in Havana, in Cuba, reported sudden unexplained head pressure head or ear pain or dizziness. It says the injuries to U.S. government personnel or their families, meaning they were targeted as well, they were part of a 60 Minutes report just recently on Sunday that suggested Russia was behind the incidents. That's where, again, 60 Minutes is pointing, one of which took place in the 2023 NATO summit, again, in uh, Lithuania. And they said this, I can confirm that a senior DOD official experienced symptoms similar to those reported in anomalous health incidents. Deputy Press Secretary Sabrina Seen told reporters on Monday. And she re referred questions on whether Russia had a role in the intelligence, uh, to the intelligence community, which is currently still investigating whether they're actually behind it. Again, the fingers pointing at Russia. We don't actually know who done it. But look, there are actually weapons like this in the United States, for example. They have crowd control weapons that weaponize the electromagnetic spectrum. A lot of these are microwave weapons. They can be pulled in the backs of trailers and they have large radar systems above them. They've been publicly demonstrated. There's videos of them using them. Arms manufacturers advertise them. We have weapons on airplanes that can do flyover EMP attacks targeted to the extent that you can shut down and destroy electronics in a single floor of an apartment building. Uh, these things already exist. Now, when it comes to weapons along these lines, there's two different segments of them. There's the sonic spectrum and there's the electromagnetic spectrum. The sonic spectrum is the spectrum of sound, meaning you can weaponize different frequencies of sound. And remember, there are some frequencies which are not audible meaning you can't hear them with your ears, but the waves of these can affect you. And they have found ways to weaponize them. There's also electromagnetic weapons. And these weaponize the electromagnetic spectrum, that is the light spectrum. Remember, even nuclear is technically on the light spectrum, as is, for example, uh, EMP, electromagnetic pulse, again, electromagnetic spectrum, as are, for example, things like microwave weapons. Some countries have entire programs dedicated to these. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party, for example, under its Assassin's Mace program, the military program the CCP has designed to take down the United States in the event of a war. It relies on surprise attack, and what it would do is target major key infrastructure. Uh, disable the things that empower us. Take out our satellites, take out the electric grid, these types of things. And in this, frankly, system that doesn't have a lot of public reporting on it, unfortunately. Based on the little public reporting we do have are documents, for example, detailing their experiments on microwave weapons, including some really horrific reports on what they were doing to animals, uh, and some very detailed reports about what these types of weapons do to the eyeballs of animals. Um, they also talk about, for example, what they call hemp attacks, high earth orbit nuclear detonation, in order to create an EMP attack to destroy electric grids. The CCP talks about this. And again, these would fit into the spectrum of these unconventional weapon systems. The Assassin's Mace being one of the main military programs of the CCP 
pointed at the head of the United States it uses these types of things. And so without a doubt, these weapons are real. They've been documented, and they're to an extent now being confirmed that they've been used, frankly. Now, and as all of this takes place, remember as well, the Chinese Communist Party is now threatening the United States directly. Barons said this. They say Chinese president, by that they mean dictator, by the way. Chinese President Xi Jinping told his U.S. counterpart Joe Biden, maybe that's accurate, his counterpart, right, that Beijing will not sit idly by if the United States continues to suppress China's high-tech development, state media reported. By this, he's referring, of course, to actually Biden, good on him, has maintained a lot of the Trump sanctions against China and even expanded some of those, especially targeting high-tech development in China going after things like the chip market. It says that she emphasized that the United States has launched an endless stream of measures to suppress China's economy, trade, science, and technology, and the list of sanctions against Chinese companies is getting longer and longer, according to a readout of a phone call between the two leaders from news agency Xinhua, one of the CCP's main state-run news outlets. And it adds, if the United States insists on suppressing China's high-tech development and depriving China of its legitimate rights, they say, to development, we will not sit idly by. Let's see, on the other side of that, remember a lot of the CCP's high-tech development is stolen technology from the United States and U.S. allies. They don't develop anything. They don't invent things. They steal it. And they steal it, then they try to beat us in the market by undercutting us because, again, they're oftentimes state-run businesses or state-subsidized businesses uh, which, again, if you try to compete against a state-subsidized business on the open market, you're going to lose because you can't compete below cost. They'll oftentimes sell below cost. And they also cut the corner of having to do R&D. They will undercut U.S. companies using technology they stole from the same companies. Now, of course, given this and given many other problems of the CCP, the United States first under Donald Trump and now under Biden, have placed sanctions to disable these key capabilities of the Chinese Communist Party and key systems that let it build a lot of its high-tech systems. Remember, semiconductors, the chips needed for smartphones and computers and many other things, they're also needed for AI, artificial intelligence, and they're also needed even for like Chinese missiles and so on. And so by restricting access to those, the United States is, in fact, putting the CCP maybe decades behind schedule of what it would like to accomplish otherwise. Given the situation, though, there is risk of the CCP being like a cornered rat may actually try something. And it appears right now the CCP is doing what I've been saying it might do. It is now encircling Taiwan with its military. Remember, I said the most plausible case of a CCP attack on Taiwan would take the form of a castle siege. I was saying this, I think maybe I was one of the first, in fact. I was saying the most plausible way the CCP would try to take Taiwan is by cutting it off, surrounding it with military ships, denying access, denying people leaving, and trying to shut it down or just staying there as an intimidating force. Maintaining that and gradually expanding that using what they refer to as the cabbage strategy or what the Soviet Union would refer to as the salami strategy. In other words, the boiling of the frog type thing, right? You turn up the heat ever so slowly, the frog boils ever so slowly, and by the time it realizes it's too hot to stay, it can no longer get out. Uh, it's the same exact thing. You do it slice by slice, layer by layer, until again you accomplish what you aim to accomplish. That is the method we're now seeing being employed. The Taiwanese Defense Ministry posted a statement on X outlining what is right now taking place. This is from the Ministry of Defense at the ROC at Taiwan. They say 30 PLA aircraft, People's Liberation Army, that means Chinese Communist Party, and nine PLAN vessels, People's Liberation Army Navy, operating around Taiwan were detected up until 6 a.m. They say today 20 of the aircraft entered Taiwan's northern middle, middle line and southwest ADIZ. That's their uh, exclusive, ec exclusive zone, which is Taiwanese territory, in other words. They say the Taiwan armed forces have monitored the situation and employed appropriate forces to respond. 
Now again, the CCP has been invading Taiwanese airspace on a regular basis. They've also been sending ships to go in the, into their territorial waters on a regular basis. But as they've done this, not only have they grown these types of operations, they've increased what seems to be a growing permanent presence. And there's a few reasons they might do this. One is, of course, to make it so they no longer respond to these things. Oh, it happens every day. Don't worry about it. And once they put their guard down, then they risk attack. Another thing is, of course, to what they call penetration test, the Taiwanese military, uh, whereby other countries do this. Russia does it against U.S. airspace, Canadian airspace, and so on. Uh, the U.S. does it too. Basically, they fly airplanes or do something that would cause a security incident. The purpose of it is to surveil the process of response. Uh, if, for example, the Chinese Communist Party were to send warplanes into Taiwanese airspace, which, note, which organization creates the first notification? Where does the alert come from? Who is notified? What is mobilized? How long does it take them? You know, they look at minutes, seconds, and so on, because for military planning, they need that type of information if they want to carry out a real attack. They need to know all the soft points that would need to be either disabled through cyber attacks or disabled through fifth column attacks on the ground uh, to take those out to make sure that that system of response would not be in place or to create systems that would distract them, for example. Uh, maybe, for example, a terrorist attack or something else to distract security forces during the time of an actual attack. That's the way those types of penetration tests work. And all countries, well, not all countries, but a lot of hostile countries do those. The CCP has been doing that to Taiwan on a regular basis. And given this situation, Taiwan is responding to the threats from the CCP publicly. And they're now stating that the country, Taiwan, will defend itself militarily if the Chinese Communist Party attacks. Asia Sentinel said this. They say, cornered by China's increasingly aggressive salami slicing tactics. The one I mentioned, right? They say Taiwan's defense ministry last week reminded China that it will fire at intruding People's Liberation Army forces even if they don't fire first. Send their troops there, Taiwan will shoot. And it's a repetition by Taiwan's defense minister, Chu, uh, Chu Kuo Cheng, of a doctrine first enunciated by uh, Chu in October 2022 when he said that the Taiwanese military would view any crossing of aircraft or vessels as a first strike. In other words, Taiwan is now saying it's not just troops on the ground. If China sends, again, military vessels, ships by sea or aircraft into Taiwanese space, that they are saying they're going to shoot them. Chu's statement is concerning, it says, because Taiwan is regarded as having no other option given the rapid expansion of Chinese gray zone tactics against his territorial integrity. And again, those gray zone tactics are the way of modern war, folks, that I've been discussing. The gray zone of plausible deniability, the gray zone of pushing things right up to the boundary of what would constitute an act of war, but never crossing it. The gray zone of all these unconventional weapons and unconventional tactics that can have the effect, for example, of a military attack but maintain a system of plausible deniability or just doing it in ways that don't look like acts of war. That is the way of modern warfare, and we see it being carried out right now globally in many different fronts. And as all of these happens, the United States is going to have a stake in all of these conflicts if they end up boiling over, which they rapidly are. Folks, that said, let's jump into some questions. Let's see here. All right. Let's see here. Uh, Mike is saying, remember when Mayor Giuliani caught so much guff for his stop and frisk policy? Yeah, they got rid of that in New York. So New York City was pretty rough in the 90s. The murder rate was even higher than it is now. Crime was, they say, higher than it is now, although I'd question because they kind of legalized crime in New York. You know, you can steal, you can do drugs on the streets, and you can do a lot of things that used to be regarded as, you know, pretty serious crime that they don't really arrest people for anymore. If you go to places like Jackson Heights in Queens, there's open prostitution. 
And so a lot of things that would normally be considered crime are no longer, people aren't arrested for it a lot of times, and so it's not included, it's not included on the crime statistics. But regardless, I would say maybe the murder rate is down, so from the 90s at least, right, even though it's up recently. One of the ways that Giuliani cleaned up New York was he created the, the broken glass policing system where every crime was prosecuted. If you so much as break a pane of glass, you will be prosecuted. If you, you know, tag or use graffiti on a building, you will be prosecuted. If you do drugs, you'll be prosecuted, so on and so forth. Everything, if it was a crime, you were charged, and there was zero tolerance on that. That, of course, led to a steep decline in crime. And they also had what they called stop and frisk. Uh, under Obama and the pressure from Black Lives Matter, they got rid of a lot of these things. Stop and frisk allowed police, for example, to stop people and frisk them, looking for weapons or drugs or whatever else. Um, they said that, that was racially targeted. And so they got rid of a lot of those programs. And they also said police are racist. And so they started defunding the police. What happened? Well. That led to light on crime policies that have caused a resurgence of all the problems we're now seeing again. And so this is what we've witnessed happen in the U.S., unfortunately. Uh, let's see, from N-S-G-E-R-G-E-R, -E -R -G -E -R, you're saying, create the problem where the solution is what you want to implement so people are thankful for your overreach. Yeah, there's a lot of dirty tricks like that, actually. So one of the things is that if... If, imagine you're a corrupt tyrant, right? You're a corrupt official, and you decide you want to implement a new policy. Uh, let's say putting, okay, I'm not, I'm not blaming New York for this, but let's just use it as an analogy. You want to put electromagnetic weapons scanners in all the subway systems because you want to, like, monitor for maybe something else, right? And you're putting additional technology within the systems that can monitor for things that are not included under the surface law. But you need those systems in place to do it, right? You need this heightened surveillance system. You want to do that, right? You want to try to outlaw guns or something like that. What do you do? Well, you go through backdoor channels and you create a need for that. You, you have the agenda, but people don't need it. They don't find that they want it. They might think it's totalitarian. You have to make people demand it. You have to make people come to your door and beg you to do it. How do you do that? Well, you'd have to increase gun violence if that was the case, right? You'd have to either maybe defund the police or eliminate stop and frisk or make it so that your you know, major crimes unit gets defunded or your organized crime unit gets defunded, all of which they've done to an extent in New York, by the way. Um, and then, of course, once those are defunded, what can you expect? Well, maybe people will start increasing crime. There'll be more crime. Then what do you do? Well, maybe you make it so that you flood it with illegal aliens and gangs from other countries who are known to be violent. You let them, for example, steal people's homes. You increase crime, increase chaos. Uh, you make it so that maybe there's gangs on mopeds going around stealing people's uh, bags or phones. You make it so these Latin American gangs uh, begin flying in from other countries to commit crimes because, you know, maybe, maybe you mess with the visa system to legalize that type of air travel. And then maybe, for example, you even legalize these illegal aliens and let them have guns. Um, I should note they've actually done all of this in the United States. All of this has actually been done by our elected officials. Um, and then maybe you take that chaos that you've manufactured and you use that as an excuse to create new totalitarian policies. Um, hypothetically speaking, by the way, uh, but I would say it's all being done, frankly. Let's see, um, question from Byrock. You're saying, do you think China would really strike the US internally, knowing that the market would crash worldwide, risking that the Chinese economy would be totally destroyed? Um, there's two different ways of viewing this. So China is the economic hub. China is the manufacturing hub of the world. I would question, yeah, you know, the U.S., we have a lot of trade with China, without a doubt, right? Um, but China also, through the Belt and Road Initiative, has maintained and created trade networks all around the world. China does not regard the U.S. as a partner. They regard us as an adversary. Now, when it comes to economy, what does the CCP actually get from us? Well, they get, like, 
business manufacturing programs, but the manufacturing is done in China. The fact that the companies we have here don't produce, they produce in China. Why does the CCP need the U.S. companies to continue producing? They don't. We have offshored all of those capabilities to China. Yes, it's U.S. companies doing that, right? But the CCP doesn't need the parent company to keep manufacturing. They can keep building all the things we gave them regardless. If the CCP were to destroy the United States, it would be like killing the landlord, and you know, Mao Zedong thought. It would be like killing the bourgeoisie, killing the person who manages the factory, killing the person, killing the boss, right? Maoist thought teaches them to do this. The CCP believes that that's a plausible solution. In fact, maybe even accomplishing what Marxism teaches them to do. If the CCP were to destroy the United States, the CCP would maintain all those factories and all those products, and they would not need to pay that extra little cost to the parent companies. That's what would happen. Sure, they would lose international investment, but then the CCP would, of course, with the United States out of the way, become the global military power capable of bringing the rest of the world to its knees. Western Europe is not going to try to attack the CCP. They can, they can barely even deal with Russia. Uh, Russia, of course, being a, an ally with the CCP, with, a, with a, what they call a, um, a no-limits agreement, would be an ally in that system. And with the United States out of the way, there would be nothing to stop them. There would be nothing to stop the CCP. There would be nothing to stop Iran. These countries combined control almost all of Latin America. They control almost all of, South, uh, all of, all of Africa. They control most of the Asia region. And of course, they, through Russia, control even to an extent um, you know, parts of Europe through energy infrastructure and so on. Something Trump actually warned Europe that would happen if they let, for example, their energy companies to be bought off by Russia. Um, the energy dependence that has been created has created a type of gun against the head of Europe. And so, collectively, if the CCP or Russia or these other countries could get rid of the United States, they would destroy the only thing holding back the tides of all these countries. And economically, the CCP would probably benefit from it because, again, they would get all the same investment, they get all the same business. Countries might not like them for it, frankly, but they would have no other choice. Um, the liberal democratic world order, as Russia would put it, would come to an end. And the new model of the world would be national Bolshevism, Chinese communism, and who knows what else. Um, again, it's a very complicated picture. I know people are like, well, isn't Russia the good guy? Look, it's all, there's a lot of propaganda in surface narrative. I think one of the dumbest moves that was made was, frankly, not allowing the U.S. to have diplomatic relations with Russia during the Trump years. I think this could have been avoided. I think that Trump could have had good relations with Putin, and that would have prevented a lot of the problems we're seeing right now from ever happening in the first place. But because rather than allow the U.S. to have diplomatic relations with Russia, they, of course, created false propaganda, the Trump-Russia collusion scandal and so on, that if Trump tried to engage diplomatically with them, they framed it as Trump colluding with a foreign enemy. That's what the, what the corporate media did and notably the Democrat establishment did in the United States. Um, and they were using that, of course, to try to impeach Trump. The effect of that was that China was pushed, or sorry, Russia was pushed to, pushed to China. And of course, they formed an alliance. That was the worst possible state we could have. Um, that was something that, again, was the reason Nixon opened up trade with China in the first place, to try to break the, you know, the Sino-Soviet pact, basically. That has been restored now. And although, again, you see, you see a lot of surface propaganda, right? Russia saying it's fighting against the globalists. In their eyes, they're talking about the liberal democratic world order. What they represent is national Bolshevism, a combination of fascism and communism. In the own words of Alexander Dugin, Putin's main advisor, written in his book, which you can read, called The Fourth Political Theory. Um, this, this is just surface propaganda, folks. Russia claims it's fighting for world Christendom and so on, but it has no problem working with the Chinese Communist Party as it persecutes 100 million house Christians. It's all surface propaganda. Iran claims it's fighting for Islam. When has Iran criticized the Chinese Communist Party for you know, having Muslim slave camps? They don't, because it's all propaganda. It's all propaganda. 
These countries don't represent what they claim to represent. They don't care about what they claim to care. They tell people what you want to hear, and they use what you want to hear as ways to make you support them doing what they want to do. Again, going back to the issue we talked about, that they try to create the problem for the solution they want to implement. This is how this stuff works. I'm not saying there's a hard, you know, good or bad, unfortunately, with the liberal democratic world order, because frankly, I'd say the whole world has been subverted by this point. The destruction of traditional morality, the demonizing and attacks on religion, uh, the destruction of traditional values, the destruction of traditional culture, these things are global. And from the destitute, or the state of destitution uh, that has been manufactured through that, we have arising from that very corrupt cultural movements and very corrupt cultural trends. When people recognize these things and see that, hey, what have we done to ourselves, they then want a new type of order. And countries using propaganda promising a return of what they destroyed uh, are then seen as the solution to that. This is the danger you're in when it comes to following too closely what is just propaganda. There's a massive propaganda war in the public right now. Um, and again, it's hard because people might think the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so, hey, if this guy criticizes the guy I don't like, he must be on my side. It's not often how it works. It's not a left or right hand issue. It's not a one or two. Uh, you have the rest of the alphabet and you have the rest of the numerical system to choose from. You don't have to choose one or the other. There's a middle ground, there's third options, there's fourth options, there's fifth options. You can think for yourself. You don't have to side with either. Um, and frankly, I think amid global growing conflicts, you don't have to get caught within the dichotomy of what the propaganda is trying to force you into. I'd say oftentimes the dichotomy is two sides of the same coin. It's two wings of the same bird of prey, right? Um, and you cannot go with either, actually. Um, and frankly, I think being able to recognize problems on both sides oftentimes is the best way. In other words, again, as global conflict increases, so will global propaganda. Information warfare is a foundation of all these things. The war for hearts and minds. And uh, it'll be important, I think, to be able to discern for yourself and judge for yourself the nature of things as this increases, because the volume is going to get very loud. And of course, I'll be here with you all for that. So it'll be uh, interesting times. U.S. citizen on the ground, you're saying, would getting rid of Marxists in our government help put out cultural fires? I'd say without a doubt. I would say the core problem within all of this is communism. The core problem within all of this is the system of socialism. These Marxist attacks on the cultural foundations and religious foundations of humankind. Uh, they have aimed to destroy these things, and this is being done notably by all these different countries. The destruction of human culture, human tradition, and human belief is what has allowed this postmodernist state of just rampant corruption, debauchery, and frankly horror show type things that uh, humanity should have never had to witness. Uh, we are facing perversions and twisted ideologies and warped, pop, war warped cultures emerge uh, that I think maybe the world never thought we'd ever see before. And I'd say a lot of that is in fact caused by communist cultural subversion and communist destruction of religion. Uh, really, I think that if you want to fix these things, one would be, for example, just voting out the Marxists. Uh, rooting out the Marxists from within the corporate structures, like the DEI structures and the ESG structures, or whatever else they want to call it. Uh, rooting out the Marxists from the national unions, rooting out the Marxists from national organizations, trying to do agit prop, agitation propaganda operations, rooting out and recognizing the Marxists and the big corporate media, uh, which work as the thought police, attacking people who try to question prevailing narratives. Uh, rooting out the Marxists in the political systems, notably on both sides of the aisle. Um, rooting out the Marxists who are in every way acting in an agenda that does not represent what they claim on the surface. And I think after rooting out the Marxists, there needs to be a program, or at least individually. I don't, I don't actually believe it can be done through some kind of forcing people to do it. I don't think force can change people's hearts. People need to want to go back to tradition. 
People need to want to go back to traditional moral values. We as a society and as a people need to have that desire to restore what was destroyed, to rebuild what was destroyed. And I think that that is the cure to the problems that are plaguing this world. And I would say that it's not hard to do, you can do it yourself, and it's not something you can force on other people. You can't make your neighbor you know, go back and start reviving traditional values and bringing back what was lost. You can't force other people to believe in your religion. Um, I don't think coercion changes anything. I'd say more than likely coercion is likely to have the opposite effect. But you yourself as an individual can look inside your heart and revive those things. And I think that that is the only solution to the ailments that are now plaguing the world. Uh, from It's Me, you're saying China has rights to development, but if people have no rights, no hypocrisy there. <laughs> yeah. I think they also mean rights to development of the technology they stole from the United States. Um, I would say, frankly, the United States should place sanctions on every single Chinese product that was stolen from Americans. Every single Chinese technology that was created through the use of economic theft, whether it's smartphones or computers or chips or wind turbines or solar panels or cars, all of these things should be sanctioned if there is even a drop of evidence that it was stolen from U.S. companies through cyber attacks or otherwise. And I'll tell you right now, if the U.S. does that, almost every single electronic in China will be banned because the CCP stole it from other countries. They are living on stolen property <laughs> to, to adopt their own narratives. They're thriving on stolen property. And so maybe it's time for us to request reparations for what was taken from us, right? Uh, mass economic theft. By the way, carried out through programs tied to their military. You might remember under Obama, that was Unit 61398 of the General Staff Department, Third Department, uh, which was the Signals Intelligence Department, the hacker armies of the Chinese Communist Party. Those operations have now been moved under the strategic support force of the Chinese Communist Party, whereby military hackers working for the Chinese, uh, the CCP, go and steal technology as a full-time job as part of their military operations from the United States, Western Europe, and so on. Any country that innovates, they will rob them. And at, when they rob them, they then take that stolen technology, they give it to what they call these um, technology transfer centers, which work at different Chinese universities and different Chinese, um, they have like academic centers. They reverse engineer, replicate those things, and then they hand them off to Chinese state-run companies, which then manufacture the products. Oftentimes, these companies will also be doing the factories for their U.S. counterparts. And then what do they do is they'll do gray market operations, not black market, but gray market, whereby they'll be doing the manufacturing for this company, but they'll start a second factory manufacturing the exact same product with a different label on it and then compete directly with the, with the product they were hired to manufacture in the first place, uh, undercut the U.S. companies on websites like Amazon or whatever else they're using, which is why if you do Google searches for technology on Amazon, you find a lot of Chinese products. They undercut them because oftentimes they get state money, so they don't have to even make a profit technically. They will put the company out of business or cut into their profits and then rise through the markets. That's the method the CCP has used to destroy the U.S. on the economic front. And notably, this is part of their warfare system called, the, called unrestricted warfare, which lists um, not just economic warfare, right, uh, but also trade warfare and so on. Trade warfare, there's different tiers of it. Economic warfare could be things that affect the GDP of a country. Uh, business warfare could be things that affect individual businesses. Trade warfare can affect things like stock market and so on like that. There's different tiers of this. But they will target every level of the, of the financial infrastructure. There's also currency warfare. The CCP has operations, for example, for currency manipulation. There's a lot of that stuff. Um, I, would think, I, I actually would say that the main system of sanctions the U.S. should implement against the CCP is to hold to account their economic theft by sanctioning every single company, every single one, that is engaged or profited from economic theft. Um, and frankly, again, that'd be just about all of them. Yeah, so yeah. 
to preventing their develop, right to development, right? Yeah, developing what they stole from us. Uh, Terrence Barksdale, you're saying, some things are a good idea, but it seems like the more we implement those ideas, the more we become like China. We create the problem and become the solution. Uh, I remember you gave that a name. Yeah, that's, um, that's the Hegelian dialectic. Um, Hegelianism was one of the main metaphysical theories of parts of Europe during the time of Karl Marx. Um, they, they were occultists, right? Um, Hegel was an occultist. And Hegel was kind of a madman, to be honest. You, you read these people's actual stuff, it's like tied in with like, I know I say this a lot, but it's tied in with like weird Satan religion stuff. Like they talk about that kind of stuff. Um, Hegel was recognized not just as a metaphysical theorist, but also as an occultist. Uh, he was into the, all these weird Gnostic ideas and stuff like that, as were most of the communist thinkers of his day. Keep in mind, communism predates Karl Marx. Um, in fact, you could trace it, the original framing of the name came from the Circle Social, which is one of the main revolutionary organizations that began the French Revolution. Um, it was the guy they called the Rousseau of the Gutter. Uh, he was also nicknamed the Pornographer who wrote some of the most sickening books I've ever read in my life. And I, researching him, I did read a lot of his works, actually. Um, so communists pre-existed. One of the main debates Marx had with the communists of his day was whether to make communism Gnostic, whether it would be more of a satanic religion. Um, and you had groups, for example, like the communist church, which that they came from the Owenites. And before that, they were followers of Sabatai Zevi, who was, um, he, he, he was one of the heretical sects that had started within Judaism. The rabbis tried stopping him. They actually tried you know, getting him arrested because he was a heretic, right? He had this whole idea of what he called liberation through sin, where you commit every type of evil. You violate every tenant of the Bible and so on. Um, and they believed that by pushing things to the opposite extreme, that it would kind of rubber band and flip to this side. Um, that was Sabatai Zevi. His ideas led to the Owenites in, in a large extent. They led to the communist church. And the communist church had weird, really weird writings. Like um, if you were to read histories of Austrian economics, for example, they have some sections about them. And they have weird things like, you know, the last phase of development where God merges into Satan in their own words and really weird things like that. And so the communist church, they had communist hymns and communist, it, it would basically replicate a religion, but it would be communist. And that was what they were pushing for. Marx wanted more of an atheistic system. People say the greatest deception of the devil was to convince people the devil doesn't exist, right? And that's what Marx mainly did. Um, and so Marx's ideas latched on to, you know, the emerging ideas of German, you know, nihilism and so on, uh, latched on to occultism under Hegelianism and used these emerging theories that were kind of on the avant-garde of, you know, the, this new vision of man and so on, and took those into a single theory and created Marxism. Um, but Hegelianism works on a few different theories that Marxism did uh, adopt, one of them being the negation of the negation, the idea that through the destruction of something, something new is created. And also, uh, again, the, the Hegelian dialectic, the Hegelian theory of like development in this regard, right, uh, which is thesis, antithesis, synthesis. And so on that point, yeah, a lot of, and I know I'm getting technical, but the Hegelian dialectic, the Hegelian tactic, is that method of manufacturing, man, wanting something, manufacturing crisis, manufacturing demand, and then achieving the synthesis of what you wanted in the first place. Um, and so it is a known tactic by very devious individuals. Um, it's something that, again, is well documented in history as a viable tactic to get what you want. And it is a communist tactic because, again, Karl Marx adopted that into his own theories. Um, and frankly, I'd say, going back to the points again, that the Marxists are the real problem. The core root in all this stuff is Marxism, folks. Now, that said, thank you all so much for being here. 
Uh, don't forget again, folks, we have a special sale right now, $1 for six months. So if you have not yet seen the special features I've done, uh, those of you on YouTube, for example, if you haven't watched my series, The Dark Origins of Communism, where I kind of I actually show you the history of a lot of these things and I open up the history books and I break this all down. Uh, you can watch that. You can watch my documentaries, The Real Story of January 6th and the other ones I've done. I also have some more coming out soon. Again, I've been doing a lot of research on the U.S.-Mexico border and the border crisis showing the U.S. agreements with the United Nations to facilitate this whole thing. That's going to be coming up very soon. I'll have an announcement soon on that. I'm also working on new ones, uh, which the time frame for these, I'm trying to do them really fast. So again, if you want to watch those, the other programs we have, the five days a week live show I do, uh, again, we have a special sale right now. Today's the last day for it. One dollar for six months. And also, folks, if you're already subscribers and you want to get a subscription for a friend or family member, again, one dollar is all you need. So sign up. And that said as well, thank you all so much for your support. Thank you for being here. I'll see you again tomorrow, 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. And as always, please take care of yourselves, stay informed, and stay free. Thank you. In every country communism gains power, authoritarianism and death followed in its wake. Communism promises a world without suffering. And yet, in its execution, does the exact opposite. Following Lenin's death, Stalin's 29-year reign killed an estimated 60 to 66 million people. More famines and purges would occur. The very peasants that communism was supposed to benefit instead starved to death under its rule. The party dictates what is right and wrong. Mao ended up killing between 50 million and 70 million people. As an investigative journalist, I want to understand why.